On today's show, Crazy Rich Asians crushes at the domestic box office. We have some fantastic four news, and we discuss the most rewatchable movies of all time. Is Harry Potter on there? Probably. What? Probably is. Movie talk starts right now. Where's the sports? Where's the sports movies on this list? All right. I, 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 <laughs> we're going to get off. into it. I promise you. Let's all start out as friends. That is my dear buddy, John Roca. This is someone very close to my heart. Perry Nemiroff, big fan of both her and her cat, Deputy Dewey. I am merely Mark Ellis, and somehow I managed to get home, take a nap, shower, and come on back here and dress <laughs> up after Collider Live this morning. Thanks to everybody who tuned in to watch Collider Live. And some point during the day, I don't know if it happened during Collider Live or it happened just before we went to air. Quieter video hit 500,000 subscribers. Look at that. Look at that. I can't take all the credit just for 490,000 of them is all due to this guy wearing a suit. What's underneath the desk? None of your damn business. We have a lot of stories to get to today, including one that just came across my desk about maybe the Fantastic Four. We're going to pop up in a movie that has just been released. Before we get to all that, we have some very exciting box office news, and that is a Crazy Rich Asians, the movie that was receiving a lot of buzz since trailers started hitting and a lot of fans of the novel started telling their friends, you got to go see this movie. It could be the field good movie of the summer and it indeed was a feel-good box office story it raked in the tune of 26 million dollars over the weekend and it has already overdone its budget which was estimated to be at 30 million dollars this is before the movies come out in most territories all across the world so when you just look at its domestic haul that is very impressive because it not only speaks to word of mouth but it also speaks to a demographic that is criminally underrepresented in the world of movies this is the first primarily asian cast that has been in a major Hollywood release since the Joy Luck Club. What's the note? Do this more often because we want to see this. Hollywood Studios, the movie's gotten rave reviews. Roca Perry, I'm not sure if you guys had a chance to check it out. Mm. I did, and I gladly paid the money to go see it because I missed the press screening. It was a really fun time, start to finish. Huge fan of this movie, and apparently a lot of other people are as well. Roca, did this surprise you, or is this one of those ones that was on your radar as this could be one of the surprise hits of the summer? I would say that it mildly surprised me in this way. Sometimes films get trumped up and get talked about and get pushed and and people go, encourage people to go see it and then people don't go almost as a rebellion or almost like I don't want to be told what to do but in this case it kind of like Black Panther people came to support the film and give it a chance and say they want to support it with their dollars and for that I applaud the moviegoers for doing that because you know the reviews have been good for the most part but not all great and so it is just a film that is representing this this idea of having an all Asian cast being a very funny situation they took took some things out of the novel that are that uh, they took some things uh, from the novel to put in the movie but they also left some things out of the movie that are in the novel that would have made this an interestingly more complex and uh, uh, difficult film maybe to explore and I applaud them for doing that though because they want to present it this way to make it easy access understandable fun enjoy yourself roll out and then we'll get more things like this you know they call it I guess I read a couple of articles calling it uh, shattering the bamboo ceiling which okay that's great I appreciate that but then we also had another film come out on Netflix that was also this Korean American uh, girl I can't remember the title right now she's got five crushes they all get exposed at the same time and she has to deal with that so right now it's it was a great weekend to release this these two fun Asian films and see how they go see how people respond to it and the fact to get a huge positive response was great what I'm surprised about is the Meg. But anyway, we'll get to it. Well, let's talk about the Meg as well, because Perry, that's another movie that's based on a novel, obviously very different subject matter than what we get with Crazy Rich Asians. But like Roca pointed out, both movies were very liberal in what they wanted to adapt and what they didn't want to adapt from the source material. And both of them, seeing Bafo box office, the Meg came in second at $21 million, <laughs> followed by Mile 22, another new wide release at only $13 million at number three. So what movie stands out the most? Is it Crazy Rich Asians? Oh my God, it's definitely Crazy Rich Asians. Is that other movie? Movie called to all the boys I love. Yeah, is yeah, that what it like is? That. Yeah, yeah. I all I saw all weekend was yeah. that in Crazy Rich Asians, and I because da- it, it's Netflix. Yep, Netflix. So I'm going to download it and save it for my next flight. But Crazy Rich Asians just has me so happy right now. It's just I'm glad I missed the press screening because I went and I paid for it, and I'm glad that I did. I. Uh, Adored this movie and then to add an extra layer onto all of that excitement of just purely enjoying the movie itself after seeing the movie and then scrolling through all my social media feeds feeds and seeing all the people that you know purposely went out and celebrated the fact that this movie exists and was important to them that just added a whole nother layer to all of the excitement I felt I am so happy that movie did really well and as for the Meg I 
part of me, because I was wavering with my predictions, like because mm. it had something like a B plus cinema score, and you know, does that necessarily mean it's going to have legs? Also, because when you have a movie that's partially horror, a lot of times it will uh, have a pretty significant weekend mm. to drop, and that's not really what happened here. And another one that kind of stood out too was Alpha. Yep. Alpha, I think, overperformed, and I've heard some pretty good things about that one. So if I had had time to catch two new releases this weekend, it would have been Crazy Rich Asians and Alpha. Yeah, Alpha just missed the number four spot at the box office. That is occupied by Mission Impossible Fallout. That was ten point seven million dollars. Then Alpha came in fifth at ten point three million dollars, but. Alpha's reported budget is $51 million. I'm not sure why, if, I mean, I, I realize the technology is a huge thing that that movie is relying on to mm. pass the bar because you have a CGI wolf slash dog, but it, I mean, $51 million, that's a lot for a movie that wasn't promoted barely at all, that it's just, you're walking in, and I saw the poster here when we were doing the show, and I'm like, oh yeah, that movie's coming out too. Heard a lot of good things about it. Two other movies that I actually know good things about, because I actually saw them, was Black Klansman, that's one of them, at a budget of $15 million, that did a pretty good uh, weekend as well, $7.3 million, and I want to give a shout out to Alicio, he's keeping us honest on the box office, with Disney's Christopher Robin. <laughs> he wants us to note that it's this close to making its budget back, did $8.8 million million dollars so Winnie the Pooh and Alicio we are thinking about you yeah. do you guys see crazy rich a Asians having legs past its opening weekend because I certainly do it's about mm -hmm. to get a lot of press worldwide yeah. because like I said hasn't even opened in some territories where it could do very well and displace the Meg from number one mm -hmm. overseas that and an A cinema score. This is a movie that is going to probably pick up steam thanks to word of mouth. And you know, I know some people hear cinema score and they roll their eyes. It's like, why should I reduce it to that? That is such a good indication though of how long a movie's legs could be. Mm -hmm. And when you get that coveted A, that could be a really big deal. And especially when you look at the next couple of weeks, the big competition that's hitting the box office, mm -hmm. there isn't really anything that's going to cross over into the crazy rich Asians uh, target audience for a good while. I think this is going to be in good shape. Yeah, I think what Perry says is right. Like this idea of there's not much coming down the pike that's going to challenge it. So that makes the most sense. But I also believe that maybe there were some people who hesitated to go see it this weekend, wanted to see what people's reaction to it was and see what the scores were. And they're like, okay, now I'll go. And then I'll go and bring or, you know, and of course it's a very strong, the Asian community is very powerful in supporting things when they like it. And so I'm sure they'll go multiple times like we saw with Black Panther being the reference or Wonder Woman to a degree. So this is, these are the things that make sense to me. I think it'll have legs for a while. I don't know if it'll break records or anything like that, but I certainly think it'll have legs. To tease another story that's coming up, you know, it's a rewatchable movie movie crazy rich Asians. <laughs> uh, it certainly is and, and it's also one of those where like people go see it opening weekend then they're like oh I want to take my yeah. grandma yeah. I want to yeah. take my kids I want to take whoever sure. to go see this movie as well so I think it's going to have a strong hold but the question is can it stand up to Melissa McCarthy and a bunch of foul mouth puppets Ooh. that movie mm. Happy Time Murders is coming out this weekend We're, a bunch of us are seeing it tonight so excited to see if it's funny or not I yep. haven't heard a whole lot of buzz about it since that trailer hit you guys both went to that pop up bar where they had a lot of the puppets mm. on hand and drinks everywhere I didn't go. I heard it was fun. Is the movie going to be good? I, I hope it's as good as that pop-up bar was because I had a blast mm. at that thing. It was, it was so well done. When we got the invite to that, I thought it was going to be, you know, a, a bar, an open bar with a couple of photo ops or something. But that whole place was transformed. The performers, both the people voicing the puppets and the human actors there were so good. It was a true immersive experience that I got a kick out of for a couple of hours. Does that necessarily mean the finished feature is as good? I sure hope so, but I, I don't really know. I was one of those puppets, so it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun making fun, voicing over that. And when Perry was talking, that's me. That's me. Perry's talking to. If you go to her Instagram story and see that it's puppet, it's not. The, that's the, how the, I knew. the person who voiced that puppet actually what? Uh, reached out on Twitter. What, what are you talking oh, about? No, that's my. That's my. Uh, found out. That's my uh, doppelganger. I tell sure. him these kinds of things. I've no, been I, accused of being a puppet as well. <laughs> there were there were free drinks there. This, uh, I don't know. I, I didn't get. I didn't yes, get invited. Was an open bar situation. Yeah. I, I Snyder took out. my invite, so he went on his own. Um, one more box office story to get to is Billionaire Boys Club, mm. the ensemble drama <laughs> starring Kevin Spacey. The movie pulled in $126 opening day. Wow. $126, as in like what? 126, not 126,000, 126, 126 dollars total. I think this speaks that uh, the public appetite to see Kevin Spacey in a movie, probably not what it once was. Yeah, that's good. 
I, I think that's good. This shows you there are repercussions for the stuff you do with the film community. It's a different time now. You do certain things, you get found out, guess what? You don't have a career anymore. That's just how it works. And I think it's a good thing. And uh, we move on. That's the best part of it all. It was interesting reading that report because I read a lot of box office reports and, you know, sometimes people format their numbers a little differently. Yeah. And it's just like normally you would have a whole number point something something and it would be, you know, that many millions. And no, that's just uh, that's just flat yeah. out how much it made. So, just yeah, flat out. I think it proves the old adage in Hollywood. Pay Christopher Plummer what he wants. <laughs> We're going to move on to our next story that just came across my desk when I walked into the studio about 20 minutes ago. And that is that there's some fantastic four concept art going around that features artists rendering of the cast of the latest Fantastic Four movie or Miles B. Your Miles B. <laughs> Teller, Michael B. Jordan, <laughs> amongst others, Kate Mara. And you have these and then you have the report that Tim Miller, if he had gone on to direct Deadpool 2, as was originally intended, was going to utilize Fantastic Four in some degree in that movie. Pear, I know Roka just finished watching Deadpool 2 and doing an upcoming commentary for it. You're the one that broke this news to me, so how was Tim Miller going to utilize the Fantastic Four in Deadpool 2, and did we as the public miss a huge opportunity by having him not direct this? I don't know about the specifics of exactly how they were going to be used, but, uh, you know, these, uh, these images surfaced from the person who was doing some concept art, and, uh, you know, my read on it based on just these images alone were you know, they, they were pretty uh, they're pretty standard. They're pretty basic. And it's just, you know, you if you scroll from one to the next, you can kind of see the copy, the copy paste of like the actor's head on a on a digitally rendered body, which is a little weird. But, you know, I think the, the big question here is what would Fantastic Four have done for Deadpool and what could that movie have has what could that movie have have done has or You're has getting there. Yep. I'm getting Sound there about. after the disaster of Fantastic Four the movie could them having appeared in Deadpool 2 have helped them out that that's the thing that's on my mind at least it's the question and I think the easy answer that I feel is I no I I don't think I I don't think them appearing in Deadpool 2 would have done anything for either franchise. And and I'm a guy who, who wanted to see Fantastic Four from the trailers. I thought the trailers were really good. But if you're going to utilize Fantastic Four in a, another comic book movie property, okay, we might have something here. If they if I hear that they were going to appear in an X-Men movie, now all of a sudden I stop and I wonder what could be. In a Deadpool 2 movie, there's characters in Deadpool 2 that you see for a total of like five seconds just for the joke. I can't imagine they weren't going to be used just for the joke in well, this movie. Well, the thing that came to my mind first, because who knows even what has stuck from Tim Miller's version to the final version we got, but just immediately I put the Fantastic Four cast members in the place of X-Force, and oh, yeah. what would have been a bigger joke or maybe even middle finger to that movie than to have them part of that whole operation and then that's just the end of them. Yeah, I mean, Rogue, I think if you're yeah. a fan of Fantastic Four, I think that you even side on the, you, you want to side with caution and not have had them appeared in Deadpool 2, because Deadpool 2, if you're making fun of Fantastic Four, doesn't that just twist the knife a little deeper, pour more salt on the wound, and give them a bigger hurdle yeah. when they come if they were used as some sort of punchline. Well, it's funny. Sometimes when you use humor to uh, almost redeem something, the fans start to forgive you more. And so it's certainly possible that if they figured out a way to walk the line, to ingratiate the Fantastic Four into Deadpool 2, that it would have worked. But you would have had to have them be like you would have had to open up to them being a little more sarcastic, a little more fun, being subject of humor, which is what Cable was, because Cable was so straight-laced, Josh Brolin's interpretation, uh, Ryan Reynolds was able to make fun of him, poke holes at him, so if that's possible, that's there. Plus, with with uh, uh, The Thing, you would have, The Thing is naturally a sarcastic guy through the comics, but also vulnerable in certain moments, so uh, Deadpool could have made fun of that, the, the invisible thing, he'd have made fun, so all of that, there was a possibility here to redeem the Fantastic Four, and I think the 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 uh, Lozano's art designs are fantastic. You get Ben Grimm a fully realized thing with the cigar in his mouth. You can see him almost saying it's clobbering time. Uh, and then the red this red suit that uh, uh, the Human Torch sometimes wears in the comics. That's the one Michael B. Jordan is wearing in those costumes. So it's great. And if you want to hear more sweatiness about this, you can watch today's Heroes episode where Coy and Amy and Trevor Steins, our guest 
talked about this and got into it a little bit more as well and what could have been. But Mark, it would have been very difficult. It's like that's a very thin tightrope to make it work. But I would have been interested to see them try. Yeah, I was going to say it sounds like you wanted to see the yeah. effort. So do you think they missed an opportunity? I think they did. I, I look. I love David. I just watched it again. Third time I've seen Deadpool two. I love what David Lee did with the film. But my mind goes to where Tim Miller, what Tim Miller could have done with this. And he might have been able to redeem the Fantastic Four. I don't think you'd have had X-Force. I think you'd have had the Fantastic Four and Cable and uh, 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 Deadpool, too. Doing, or Deadpool, rather, working through what they were working through in the movie. Oh, but like Perry says, I don't know what was kept and what wasn't kept from the original uh, concepts for it. So. Well, that's also why I said a big joke and also a middle finger. Because it feels like, yeah. especially with Fantastic Four, the people who are rooting for them to be brought to screen in the yeah. right way and the nature of what Deadpool is with Deadpool mm. making fun of other yep. failed superhero movies it would have been a very uh, a delicate line to worry about crossing in terms of yeah. offending the fandom yeah. versus having a joke at their expense that actually works and sheds them it puts them in a better light if that makes sense yeah and I'm not sure if you I'm not sure if that cast of Fantastic Four would have worked with Ryan in that way to be the butt of jokes I don't know if it would have worked chemistry wise well let me spin this forward into a different universe then because I know that Fox has a lot less riding on whether a Green Lantern movie does well or not but does the fact that the Green Lantern Ryan Reynolds' incarnation of that that they keep cracking jokes that work really yeah, well they're yeah. really funny does that hurt the Green Lantern at, not necessarily as far as a movie but just in the public perception it is like does that hurt us getting over that movie and being accepting of possibly a new Green Lantern core announcement I mean, it's hard to give just like a flat out answer to that because mm -hmm. in my mind, I have no attachment to the Green Lantern source material. The movie came and went, no big deal. It had Ryan Reynolds in it. It is kind of funny that he's poking fun at himself, but for anybody out there who Green Lantern is their favorite superhero character i wouldn't be surprised if some folks out there were kind of like like enough already like let's get past it and give this character a new opportunity what's well, the aquaman thing because aquaman had a it, like there's a reason why dc doesn't relaunch any of their film universes and kick off with aquaman because that was a very tough character because it was the butt of jokes for so long and now we're excited about aquaman movie x amount of years decades later yeah. because we have a badass playing him and it looks cool and we've seen little bits and pieces of aquaman in other movies and we get excited about that yeah and i see people on certain sites write uh, reappraisals of the Green Lantern movie and I want to go insane. Some hot takes you don't actually have to have. You know, some films just suck and we can move on. I mean, I remember we liking it. <laughs> I do. I remember enjoying it. All right, so Green Lantern, so I think it's been far enough, though, enough time to move on from it. We've had three iterations of Spider-Man, for God's sakes. So, I mean, I think it's uh, it's possible to move on and, uh, and it all depends on the casting because we were talking about, again, the rumors of Tom Cruise. Is he going to play Hal Jordan he supposedly in talks to do it but if he does it like you know Michael B. Jo like who would come on to play Jon Stewart would he want to hand the mantle off all those kinds of things so I think the, a Green Lantern version is possible but it might not be the Hal Jordan Green Lantern which is the original Green Lantern that everybody loves so much it might be Jon Stewart it might be Guy Gardner it could be any number of other guy, Green Lanterns that have come after that are earth based so I think it's possible and Ryan making fun of it I don't think does anything other than it's fun for Ryan it's fun for those of us now who can step back years later and be okay with it and, and, and make fun of it. Well, it's easy to talk about movies. You know what's really hard? Making them. And some bold filmmakers gave their best shot at making a short film thanks to our friends at Road. They had a really cool contest that's still going on called My Road Reel. You can go to MyRoadReel.com and a bunch of filmmakers made shorts that are about three minutes in length that could be in any genre that they preferred. And they made a behind the scenes vid of them utilizing a road product in the productions. What you guys can do now is go to MyRoadReel.com and watch the movies. You can vote on who you think did the best job and who deserves a portion of the $1 million prize purse. Just go to My MyRoadReel.com, watch a bunch of cool shorts, and cast your vote, make your voice heard, and help a young filmmaker out there. Or they could be an old filmmaker. I mean, you could be 110 and use the road products and make a movie, and I'd actually really like to see that. Well, <laughs> some movies that we love that are feature length are highlighted in a new segment on Collider.com. That would be the article that just came out, the most rewatchable movies ever made. 29 of them, to be specific. A lot of the Collider writers cast their votes and said this, no this, no wait, this one is the most rewatchable movie of all time. We've got 29 of them. Some of the more popular highlights include your Goodfellas, A Few Good Men, The Lord of the Rings, 
The, the, all the Lord of the Rings movies? Yeah, I mean, just the three Lord of the Rings movies. I don't think they counted The Hobbit in there, but they counted the Harry Potter franchise as well. And then some more controversial picks. There was one holiday movie that was Christmas Vacation. That's the one they decided to go with. Perry Nemiroff, you see this list. We respect all the Collider writing staff very much. <laughs> Do we respect their picks in this instance? Are these the 29 movies that needed to be on the most rewatchable films of all time? I respect their picks because it's not like this was a ranked title type thing. Everybody chimed in with what they found to be the most rewatchable movies and that it was a collaboration in that respect. It wasn't them like weighing it and saying that one's not as worthy as that one. So these were very personal and if you get into reading the write-ups, I think they make great personal cases for a lot of these movies. If I had to kind of pare it down to the ones that I think are most deserving, again in my personal opinion, in my eyes, I mean, no surprise, I went with uh, Jurassic Park. Which is on the list, yeah. And speaking of holiday movies, Elf is on there for me. All I right. could watch and right. rewatch Sorry, Elf buddy. all holiday season long. Mean Girls and uh, Ferris Bueller. Those are probably the, the best of the best on that list for me. And uh, do you want me to wait to tell you what I'm going to add to that list? Because I got some movies to add. Yeah, Perry seems chomping to the bit here, Roka. What movies no, you do don't you say. With, with the games you play, if he names something that I pick, I'm in trouble. Let her, let her just do it. Huh? Let her just. Well, do I want to hear how competitive she is. I want to hear your take less. on the let actual list first. Care less. I, I want to hear the picks that were on the list that you happen to agree with. Oh, a lot. Social Network, I agree with. Uh, I don't agree with Band of Outsiders. I want them to prove to me that they're rewatching Band of Outsiders a lot. Um, Harold Maud's an interesting choice. I think a lot of people have an uh, intrinsic attraction to that film. Uh, that's like personality based. You have to be built a certain way to enjoy that film over and over. See, and over. I think there's something about Mary who's more rewatchable than Harold and Maud. Well, where sure. they cite Harold and Maud as a great movie right, to watch right. over and over uh, I enjoyed the, uh, a number of films. Uh, Memento is great. Fifth Element was nice to include in there as well. The Matrix. The Matrix is something I revisit all the time and I think Warner Brothers is about to release another uh, updated version of The Matrix that's even more cleaner than before which is incredible. That film just keeps lasting the test of time. The less said about the sequels the better. Um, but I will throw in the fact that, that I, I look I respect the writers. I deal with them on email. I talk to them. I, they're great people. Very intelligent about film. But let's let's loosen up a little bit. Let's, you know, let's throw some, like, sports movies in there that are in... Because if we're talking rewatchable, not AFI top one, rewatchable. I guarantee you, you've got some other films on on your shelf that you rewatch over and over again. Hoosiers is rewatchable. Major Leagues is rewatchable. You want to step out of there? Give me a gangster film. Scarface is a rewatchable movie. When Harry Met Sally's not on this list, that's ultimately insanely rewatchable. Way more than Crazy Rich Asians. So there's there's a bunch of rewatchable movies, I think, that are missing off this list because these are... I, I don't felt to me like we're going to show off what we know about movies and we'll, we'll move a Jurassic Park or we'll move a, but I wanted to see something more like something more fun well, not see, a lot of fun I, I, I like the I like the unpredictability of this list because there's movies okay. on here that everybody's going to so like Back to the Future Jurassic yeah, Park yeah twists. those are all time yeah. rewatchable movies and there's other ones that's like oh wow I, either I've never seen it or I do not consider it rewatchable but that's the, the beauty of diversity of opinion and I hate to burst your bubble here Roka there are sports movies on the list Where? Uh, The Big Lebowski is a bowling movie <laughs> Uh, Magic Mike XXL Not is a, a competitive dance movie. <laughs> uh, we're dancing for dollars in Magic Mike, and I'll see if I can find any other Where's ones. Where's the Rocky movies? 99% of this country rewatches Rocky movies. What are you talking well, about? Well, obviously, I have a problem with uh, with the, the Harry Potter as a franchise yeah. being counted, and Lord of the Rings as a franchise, but not Star Wars. Where's Star Wars? Yeah, right, I mean, exactly. Star Wars. Like, or say what you want about Star Wars or what the current regime is doing with Star Wars, but like, how do you not have the classic Star Wars trilogy? Yeah. Where's the Godfather? Any list of rewatch. But, uh, okay. Godfather. I'd rather have Star Wars, I, you know. Um, Perry, let's go back to you yes, to Perry. add some movies, and I will just remind the <laughs> entire panel movies. that yes, I, I am. You actually I'm gonna, didn't name a single one on my list. So I'm going to invoke okay the rule right now. that you you cannot take a movie that somebody <laughs> else has. These are individual lists, and I will remind everybody watching at home: don't worry, Roadhouse is on the 29 most rewatchable <laughs> movies list. It's going to be okay. The four is yours, right. Perry. I was really worried Roka was going to pick this particular movie. That's why I wanted to go first. Final Destination. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know you were give it. Which one? Which um, one, Perry? If I had a, if I had a, you know, uh, use the franchise rules for Final Destination, I would probably. 
I mean, this is a lie. I would probably rewatch every single one except four. But if I had to say the most rewatchable, it would be one and two. Okay. But then obviously Scream would be on the list for me. Mm -hmm. Scream would have a, a very high spot if this were a ranked list. I also have uh, A Nightmare Before Christmas. That's another one that I could mm -hmm. watch and rewatch and listen to that music over and over and over again. And then the other one I wanted on this list was Stand By Me. That Stand one by me, I choice. cannot get enough of. Yeah, and I, and I wonder if like the Shawshank Redemption gives Stephen King his, his quota for stories, but because mm. uh, you have to wonder with that if like you know everybody's thinking, well, let me go off the beaten path with this pick or with that pick. So Roca, those are yours. Some of the ones that the chat room is giving us right now. Uh, a couple of people saying The Hangover, sure. um, The Rocketeer, most Pixar movies yeah. is another yeah. one. No Twister, Pixar. Mrs. Doubtfire, Twister. Heat? What else do you have? Heat, Heat? Schwartz. There's no Schwarzenegger. TBS and TNT make a whole living out of rewatchable movies, and Schwarzenegger lives and breathes on there. I thought Ocean's Eleven or Ocean's Thirteen certainly mm -hmm. that's those are ultimately very enjoyable and rewatchable movies. There's a lot. Here. Bridesmaids is eminently rewatchable. Yeah. That should be on the list, absolutely. And there are no superhero movies on this list. Where's Superman the movie? Very rewatchable. Dark Knight, very rewatchable. So to me, I think there these are great choices, but I think there's other they're a little bit more fun. Let's have a little more fun. That's all. Uh, Podunk Part says uh, Monty Python, the Holy Grail, yes. appealing to my greater sensibilities. I would heartily agree with that. And uh, I mean, the scene Scott Pilgrim, Deadpool. Mm -hmm. The one that I think that I would actually put on there, I'm not going to put it above Star Wars. I said my piece about Star Wars is that the most rewatchable movie. I think Top Gun is very rewatchable. Hell yes. And I think Days Confused might be yeah. the most rewatchable. Watchable. It's certainly the movie that, that me and my friends watched the most in college was Days Confused. And it's fun because I, I, I hadn't seen that movie until I got to college. Right. And then we proceeded to watch it like every day for a long time. Tombstone was another one. Oh, yeah. Lebowski was on there. Um, so a lot of rewatchable movies. Love to hear what you guys have to say. Either keep throwing them in the chat room or let us know after the fact in the YouTube comments. What makes a great rewatchable movie, though? I mean, that's really the question is, what is it about a movie that makes you want to watch it over and over again, even though we know what's going to happen we know every line of dialogue we know all the beats why are these movies still endlessly rewatchable i think that's why we're getting so heated over this is because rewatchable is largely uh in touch with what you want personally mm -hmm. in a movie and with what you enjoy i mean there's a reason that my rewatchable list will have a lot of slasher movies on it but roca's will have a lot of westerns it's whatever yeah, speaks sure. to who you are and that's why i appreciate these kinds of uh group features even more so than when someone takes the time to like rank an entire franchise by themselves because this to me is a representation of how many different interests mm. everybody has out there and just like the the possibilities when it comes to uh really having having just a whole wide range of creative opportunities in the industry. So that's that's like my, my cheesy uh, love what you love answer to that question. Yeah, Roka, what makes a movie rewatchable and what's your most rewatchable Western of all time? Uh, probably Magnificent Seven. Oh, you, know, oh, you yeah, mispronounced yeah. Young Guns too. Oh, did I mispronounce Young Guns <laughs> Mispronounced too? it. A butt shot does not a Western make, Mark Ellis. Uh, that was in me, the first one. For, no, it isn't. It's in the second one. It's Emilio's butt in the first not one. A, but and it's, it's uh, uh, the, the Redheads. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Right. So uh, a butt shot does not make a young a, a Western. But for me, uh, it's a, what Perry said. I think I want to piggyback on what Perry said. It's personal. It's very personal. It's how what, how you were raised, what you what influenced you from a kid, and, and what touched you at certain times. Top Gun, for me, is the most eminently rewatchable movie I uh, I know for me. I've seen it maybe five million times. Like it's just so good because it brings me back to being 15, 16 years old again and like like feeling cool and what that what that must have felt like for a nerdy fat kid like me. Like seeing this was awesome. And so to me, it takes me to that place all the time and the possibilities and the fun of that. And uh, and and there I think there's also personal experiences that come into play as you grow and get older and you mature. The certain films you come back to because they may remind you of your parents, remind you of a girlfriend or, or boyfriend, remind you of a time in your life when you felt most powerful, or maybe a time in your life when you weren't sure if you what was happening in your world, and this movie came along and like sorted you out, or something like Caddyshack, which is something you come back to that just makes you laugh even on your most sad day. You can put it on and have a great time with it because the jokes still work. Now let's dance. It's so I'm just saying. Gotta have that personal, t the, maybe yeah. the most personal, rewatchable 
Movie to me, sports movie, White Men Can't Jump. Yep. God, I love that movie. I think it's the best. It might be my favorite sport, not just basketball, mm. but it might, might be my favorite sports movie okay. in general, with all apologies to Kevin Costner and the multiple things that he does on a baseball diamond. Well, I want to remind you guys that Collider Live debuted today. We talked about a trilogy of pretty rewatchable movies themselves. Die Hard. Talked about that and a whole lot more. The zaniness was off the proverbial chain, and you guys can catch a new episode of Collider Live tomorrow, 10 a.m. PST. It's going to be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday every day, as the name implies. It is live, and you can check out today's episode of Collider Live right after you're done watching Movie Talk right here on Collider Video or in podcast form. And make sure you guys check out, as we had at the top of the show, you saw that graphic. We have new Collider Live shirts courtesy of our friends at Bonfire. You can check out the link in this vid's description to pick up some of those. We have a whole network you can subscribe to, both in podcast form and here on YouTube. Collider Games, Collider Quick, Collider Sports, and the Wrestling Sheet. Check it all out. Links are in this vid's description. Well, now we got a pair of trailers to get to, and the first one is going to sound very familiar when I say Robert the Bruce. You're thinking, oh, what movie is that? Oh, that's a rewatchable movie, Braveheart. Well, we have a new telling of the tale, this time focusing on Robert the Bruce, and it's for Outlaw King. The trailer debuted this morning. It's a Netflix movie. It's going to have a limited theatrical run, just in case any Oscar voters want to go see it, and it's coming out in Netflix November 9th. Starts Chris Pine. As Robert the Bruce, he was a defeated nobleman to an outlaw hero during Edward I's occupation of medieval Scotland. Robert assumed the crown, he assembles an army, and he stands up to the tyranny of both him and his son, the Prince of Wales. Perry Nemiroff, got a chance to watch this. I'm sure you've seen Braveheart many times. Chris Pine, Robert the Bruce, how'd this trailer hit you? I, th- I thought the trailer was solid, but to be honest, th- this isn't my type of movie. I think they needed to sell me on it a little better in order to get me to count down until I get to see this movie. But, you know, the visuals are fantastic. I'm a big fan of Chris Pine. Uh, David McKenzie, the idea of him going from hell or high water to this is really exciting. Yeah. I think it looks great. There was just that that little spark, I think, that was missing from the trailer that would get me, someone who, you know, just doesn't gravitate towards this kind of movie, to really be looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up David McKenzie, and as I go to the man with the worst poker face in the studio, hmm. uh, that's really the lead here to me, more so than Chris <laughs> Pine playing Robert the Bruce, but the hurdle this has to overcome is that everybody is so familiar with the movie Braveheart. If you tell me David McKenzie's doing this, I'm instantly locked in yep. into whatever he's doing and this story I find pretty compelling so I'm excited to watch it. and I thought the trailer did a really good job of selling us that this is different than Braveheart mm-hmm. is that going to do a good job with general audiences who are seeing this on YouTube for the first time yeah I hope so I mean I th- David McKenzie being a Scottish director obviously has a little more of a like a, I don't know a personal con- a connection to this he story he can tell you if you're getting the accent right right that's for sure yeah 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 so that there so you cast someone like Chris Pine who he's already worked with on Hell or High Water brought out one of his greatest performances ever that he's done so far as an actor so you see Chris Pine trusting him though I think the accent worked I loved this trailer absolutely loved it the visuals were right for me and like Perry says like it's not something she gravitates this is my wheelhouse absolutely these are these are my rewatchable movies you know and uh, so I enjoyed that I like the sparseness of it but then the building of the drama throughout the thing and the, the fact that they kept going back to him on the boat I thought that was great because where is he landing is he just is he like thinking about everything that's happened that led him to this moment where he's landing on the shores and about to lead this army into this full blown attack we shall see and you know at the end of Braveheart they have the uh, epilogue where they talk about what Robert the Bruce does and blah 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 so it's not just it's so I think that's what the the toughest uh, chore this film has is to destroy people's thoughts of what Angus McFadden did in Braveheart where he betrayed William Wallace where he wasn't really strong didn't stand up to his father till the end and then finally did something and I wonder if William Wallace will have a play so I was going to ask this. you do, is, is there a role for William Wallace here I mean obviously yeah. they're telling the story the way they want to tell it but right. do you think that that would serve the movie well to have more connectivity with Braveheart at least a storyline that people are familiar with I think you can't be afraid to redo a historical character we see it multiple Multiple times, and we have, we have multiple Batman. So I mean, why can't you have a multiple? We have the Wallace? same Christopher Columbus twice, <laughs> two different true, people, the true. same year. So I mean, uh, you know that I think that it might be Wallace who lifts up his things. Will you join me with Robert the Bruce? It might be him. So and the you know and Braveheart took some liberties with the actual story. So this could be more historically accurate. It certainly feels. 
how can I say this? It certainly feels like a more serious movie than Braveheart was. I don't think you'll have him sliding off to have sex with the French queen. I don't think that's going to happen. So that I think I like about this. is It feels very war-based. It feels very like uh, uh, tactician-based. It feels very much about leading a people inspirational. And so I like that about it. Well, this. yeah. I mean, if you've ever seen Braveheart, it's not a bunch of guys been slipping on banana peels. Yeah, it's a pretty well, no, serious movie saying, in its own right. There's a lot of jokes through the whole movie. <laughs> not like, why is there a chimp in a tuxedo smoking a cigar? <laughs> this is Scotland, guys. <laughs> um, I'm going to move on to a trailer that I think Perry might respond to a little bit more. At least I hope she did, because I enjoyed this one, too. It's for freaks. And it's I'm going to say it's from the directors of Leprechaun Origin. However, <laughs> however, they're also the team behind the new live-action Kim Possible movie, and they met as competitors on Steven Spielberg's contest. This movie in particular stars Emile Hirsch. He's a disturbed father. He locks his seven-year-old in the basement just to, to protect her. It, it's it shades of, like, John Goodman in the Cloverfield movie. And then she hears this voice by Bruce Dern that's encouraging her to escape and go experience what the world has to offer. Perry, this looks like a freaky trip. Did you like this one? You see how I programmed the show? A little for Roca, a little for me. That's our showrunner, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, no, I everything that is, uh, that's that's going to debut at TIFF, we're going to start to get a lot of trailers. So I would expect a lot of trailers on Movie Talk in the next two weeks because, I mean, really, some of the biggest premieres are about to happen. And this one is definitely on my radar for that midnight lineup. And I think it's just one of the two directors who worked on that Leprechaun movie, so maybe we shouldn't throw them both under the bus. But <laughs> even then, I, I love their <laughs> story too because I always like hearing about how people get into the industry and I find it fascinating that they met on that Spielberg show mm. and how they've kind of uh, come to this point together and it's really curious that they are doing that Kim Possible movie because it doesn't seem in line with this or Leprechaun whatsoever but one of the things I like most about this trailer is it's super short and sweet but every single image you could freeze frame and there, there's something to analyze there. There's something in those, those images that can start to help you to maybe piece everything together without revealing pretty much anything at all. It's just a whole bunch of stimulating in imagery and you know, Emil Hirsch, uh, Autopsy of Jane Doe, I feel like that movie kind of went under the radar mm -hmm. and he was great in that but I love the idea of Bruce Dern being that character in this movie. I, what, what is the name of the character? Uh, Mr. Snowcone or something yeah. like that. Mr. Snowcone, yeah. That just Bruce Stern as Mr. Snowcone in Freaks just really makes me happy. <laughs> All right, well, Perry freeze framed every ounce of this trailer yes. and join <laughs> it over and over again. Were you like Jay Giles band and employed the same tactic? Yes, I will come closer to this trailer than Perry did to the trailer. I liked oh, it. Oh, what I a guy. Say, well, I'm what a magnanimous a guy fella. that way. No, honestly, <laughs> this was a, I, first when they when I saw this, I was like, oh, Perry no horror, here we go again. And I looked, and this trailer is because uh, I thought it was a remake of Freaks initially, right? Mm -hmm. I thought, oh God, I don't want to see that. Uh, but this looks, this gave me hereditary vibes. When the first time I saw that hereditary mm. trailer, it scared the living hell out of me. This does as well, especially that red fog thing next to her face. Like, I was just like, oh man, what is this? So to me, this looks fantastic, and it looks like it's gonna scare the bejesus out of me. And like you said, Emil Hirsch has had me since Into the Wild. I've always enjoyed his performances at Milk as well. So I like to see him. Am I, is that right? Uh, yeah, Milk as well, right? So I, I, I like to see him. Yes, Adam says yes. So I like You're to see him. You're pronouncing the name Milk correctly. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank Some you. people say Milk and it really bothers Milk? me. Milk? Yeah, they say, hey, I'm going to get a glass of Milk. I don't know what the hell Milk is. That's something that Alf drinks on I, Melmac. It's called Milk. It's got an I in it. It's I not think, Milk. I think Robert the Bruce is Milk. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I would say. So I, for me. Go some Milk the cow. Get the Milk. Uh, so to me, uh, I, I like this. And it. It scares me, and I think it's brilliant to only release 30 seconds, 50 seconds, just to get you scared enough, and then boom, you're out. I like that That's tactic, perfect. too. Yeah. Less is more. Yeah. If, if you want to do a deep dive into the trail, you can. I encourage everybody to do that. We're going to also encourage you to tweet us right now at Collider Video. Use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk and weigh in on any of the topics we discussed here today. Ask us whatever the hell you want. But, Roka, you mentioned you yeah. got scared watching this trailer, just like Hereditary did. Sure. Do you get scared, like, watching it? Like, does it stay with you afterwards? Do you have trouble sleeping after Films? you see a horror movie? Yes. This is why, see, the thing is, I, I, here's what I'll tell you. Um, Perry knows the genre. I, certain films are, I love great horror. So, when I go to horror films and they scare the sh crap out of me, I 
It stays with me for a while. <laughs> nice catch. Am I like, yeah, paranormal activity stayed with me for three or four days. The yeah. first time. I could not sleep alone. Did you live by yourself I at closed, that point? Yeah, and I closed yeah. every closet door that there was, and I just was afraid. Because I have a th- being raised Catholic... Uh, One day I'm going to make baby powder footprints by your desk. <laughs> <laughs> be around you terrible person. Being raised Catholic, the, the idea of, the God, of God and the devil is very powerful. Demons, uh, the devil trying to lure you. That stuff is deep in my, bo- in, in my body. So when I see it on, done well in horror or something like A Quiet Place, I literally, like I, I've said before, I spent 10 minutes staring at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen because it was scaring the living hell out of me. That's why I don't, that's why I'm not a connoisseur of the genre like Perry because I don't have the emotional, I don't have the emotional strength to handle watching these horrors over and over again because they really do decimate me inside when I go see them and I'm scared to watch them sometimes uh, because of what they, the, the lasting effect they have on me. Yeah, Perry, is this just like some sort of uh, masochistic uh, enjoyment that you have is that you know it's going to scare you after the fact and it's going to keep you up and you're going to be shaking in your bed like Rose or or do you just handle it better or does it come with practice because you've seen a lot of horror movies I don't know if it's uh, if it's something I could uh, link to practice but when I was a kid I used to do the corner of the screen thing oh, it's yeah. like especially when you're you're in your early teens and you want to be cool with your friends and you want to think that you want them to think you're looking at the screen but really you're looking at like the teeny dot in the corner <laughs> or something I remember those days yeah. but I don't know nothing nothing really stops me from sleeping at night and you know even when we had the mail incident I was just going to say the mail was Will. There's something, no, there's something about that feeling of like having your stomach drop, like on a roller coaster, or or that feeling immediately after a jump scare. That yeah. I mean, it 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 gets my adrenaline pumping. I like it. Yeah, I love a good jump scare, and I stare right at the screen, even if I know it's going to scare me. I'm just, I I, I want to take it head on. I will mm-hmm. play chicken with the movie and usually lose. I love the first two paranormal activity. The third one is great. I love the oscillating yeah. fan. Yeah. If I'm haunting somebody, and let's say I don't wait, let's say I want to get them out of my house, mm-hmm. I'm not doing the crazy paranormal activity for like all the stuff in the kitchen yeah, is yeah. on the ceiling. I'm just doing little things here and there. I'm going to be a constant thorn in your side if you move into my house after I pass away. If I don't like if i like you i'll probably just hang out and watch football all right (laughs) what do we got now the witching hour speaking of horror movies listen to it because your good friend perry nemeroff is the host of the witching hour all new episode coming this week what are we talking about perry uh this week we have a full show of stephen king we're talking Mm. uh mr mercedes we're talking castle rock and then we're gonna have a, a friendly debate about whether stephen king's books are better suited for film or television Ooh. I yeah. like that. Good question. That's a good like that, I like that too. And you're not going to give us your answer. Do you have an answer? Uh, television. I've, I have found so far that I've enjoyed the television uh, versions of the film of the of Stephen King stuff more than the film stuff. But the film stuff is catching up lately. So I, I look forward to see how well that does. And shout out to my friend Andre Holland, who is the lead in Castle Rock. So that's great that you're talking about it. Yeah. Very nice. Hello, Andre. Thanks for watching the program. And please. Have a place for Roka to sleep when he sees a scary <laughs> movie. We also have a new Schmodown coming out tomorrow, and you can check out Kawhi Live, like I said, 10 a.m., and then back to Movie Talk, 4 p.m. tomorrow morning. Let's get to some Twitter questions. Vincent is up first, and he keeps the horror theme going. He says, speaking of rewatchable films, what is your most rewatchable horror film? His pick is Cabin in the Woods. It's fun, and if you've seen the movie... There's always something else that you notice from the final act. I have seen Cabin in the Woods maybe twice. I loved it, but I've seen it maybe twice. So I think it would be fun to go back and investigate things that you can pick up on that it's dropping hints about what is to come because there's a lot of twists and turns that movie takes. And I also love the REO Speedwagon in it. Perry, most rewatchable horror flick? What do you think? <laughs> um, probably going to go with, for you... Jurassic Park is not a horror movie. Not a horror movie. Um, so I don't know how you, you already uh, semi referenced it today. Leprechaun. Movie talk. It might have something to do with my my cat's namesake. Uh, Dewey. Scream. Oh right, <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Dewey. To throw out, uh, you know, I, I say Scream and Final Destination sure. all the time. Uh, I I will say uh, 2017's It is very very rewatchable for me. I also catch myself rewatching The Hills Have Eyes remake all the time. <laughs> I, I don't think Roka oh, shares like that sentiment. What's wrong with that one? You're an insane person. I can't <laughs> handle that movie, dude. Last it's, House on the Left, really I can't disturbing. handle those. Mm-hmm. Any of those. Uh, uh, yeah. I have a hard time with those. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know. Anything Hitchcock, I suppose. If you, I, I have a hard time classifying Hitchcock <laughs> as horror, though, to be honest with you, because I don't really have a jump scare in the Hitchcock. You don't need a post. jump scare. I mean, that's, mm. that's the cool thing about the horror genre, yeah. is that what scares everyone is different. So yeah. it's like the, you know, the demon-based movies may be more scary to someone. Yes. Someone else may freak out when they think <laughs> a, a real-life slasher could be out there. I don't is know. Alien a horror? Yeah. You, I, I consider like, the first Alien a sci-fi. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, I would say Alien, definitely my number one rewatchable horror. I love that film. And you can rediscover it over and over and over again. Really interesting things they do with that film. Script-wise and uh, sci-fi-wise and special effects-wise. Really incredible. So when I was a kid at Video Update, because we didn't have a blockbuster in my hometown, uh, you'd go there and in the sections, they had Jaws in the horror section. Uh, I get it. I get it. I, I consider Jaws a great drama more than I consider it a great horror movie now. But if you want to put that in the horror section, that's obviously the most rewatchable movie for me. I feel like it's an action adventure. Because okay. you're going on an adventure in the boat to catch the shark. Not everything has to be classified well, under one genre. I'm just saying. It could have tinges of many genres. He didn't like the horror aspect. Well, there's, there's not tinges of many genres section in the blockbuster. You got to put it somewhere. There's not enough swashbuckling on the boat. But to then it would just confuse people. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to <sighs> before we reorganize. God. Sorry, all Mark. The box blockbuster. No, it's fine. This is what this is what the show is about. It's diverse. Do you have an opinion? You want to call Jaws a comedy? Have at it. <laughs> Jonathan Caro says, let's have some fun with this. If you were to tweak a movie, what movie would be better with Muppets alongside its cast? <laughs> oh, so oh, we're gosh. just like Happy Time Murders coming out this weekend. Name a movie that you think would be improved with Muppets. My easy answer to that question, Jonathan, is any movie would be better with Muppets in it. And look no further than the Muppet Babies episode of Star Wars. It's mm -hmm. the best thing Star Wars has ever put out. So... The Muppet Babies episode of Star Wars is proof that Muppets make everything better. you got to pick a particular film that you want to see Muppets in. I'll take Eyes Wide Shut, and I'll move on. <laughs> um, given given the, uh, the puppet blood and murdering in Happy Time Murders, I would watch a Final Destination movie with puppets I in like it. I like that a lot. <laughs> it's I like, like what, what would the opening kill scene be? Yeah. All right, Roki, you got to beat Eyes Wide Shut. And Final Destination. I think Scarface would be a great film. <laughs> <laughs> you might have done it. It's a great yeah. question. Say hello to my little friend. He's sitting on top of his shoulder. Yeah, it's perfect. The rat, whatever the rat his name is, it's all possible there to play with. Uh, I think that would be fun to see a Muppets version of Scarface. All right, I like that a lot. We move on to David Wilson. He says, hey, Collider Movie Talk. My question is, with the Meg crushing it right now, what do we have to do to get Mark Ellis to perform in St. Louis with John Roca opening for you? What? <laughs> yeah, that's... that is some money. We can go to Funny Bone there. It's a yeah. good, good, good a lot of drunk crowds in St. Louis, so be ready to handle stuff late at night. Oh, I can handle some drunks, please. I will drive to St. Louis, though. I can't fly. I can't afford to fly a plane ticket to St. Louis. That's pretty expensive. If, if fans are willing to fly us out, <laughs> I'll go. Do you realize St. Louis is like a multiple-day trip? You're going to have to pop for a hotel and really? gas. And, yeah, have you, ever, have you ever seen a map? I'm not really a traveling comic, uh, Mark Ellis. I'm more of a, if I'm in the town, I'll do it. Yes. Kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> Boy, what a, what a great day. Dating profile you must have on Tinder. If, I, hey, if I'm there, I'll do it. You know, ladies. You want to drive to St. Louis with me? <laughs> How dare you? My, my girlfriend's watching this. How dare you? I am glad that Dave Wilson reminded me, though, because I did announce on uh, Quiet Alive this morning. I currently have a pinned tweet up right now. I just announced I'm going to be doing a theater in Atlanta during Drag Dra Dragon Con Friday, <laughs> August 31st. I'll have to get that right before I go on stage. And then I'm going to be doing a big show here in Los Angeles. You're in town. Oh. We'll see if he's around at Los Globos Theater, October 26th. All you got to do is retweet that pinned tweet, and you are in the running automatically for me to send you a Blu-ray copy of Avengers Infinity War autographed by everybody here. I didn't ask anybody permission but i'm gonna put in front of them and they will sign it or else face dire consequences mm. one more question and we'll call today <laughs> charles turner says can you recommend a good website where you can read movie scripts is there a good site out there is there some sort of a there used to be drew's scriptorama where you could go yeah. and w read uh, scripts online there i remember that isn't it like I like IMDBS or something? Oh, yeah. A, a I go to. So, yeah. I mean, really, I just you know I'll just go on Google and Google Jurassic Park script or something like that. And normally yeah. you get you get an option. Is there like a good option. movie script? Like, can you guys remember reading a movie script and you're like, oh wow, this is actually this enhanced the movie experience? 
Well, at, when award season comes around, we get the awards DVDs in the mail, and then also the ones that are up for the screenplay honors will send out hard copies, and every once in a while, I'll read one. The last one I read that I think really struck me, and I love the movie, too, but was the, the screenplay for Carol. I, oh, I really, okay. nice. yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just, I think I got a little something extra out of reading it in addition to seeing the movie. All right, Roka? True Romance and uh, Good Will Hunting. The original True Romance script that Tarantino released in the book is fantastic better than the movie and uh it does fill in some holes uh from the movie and good the good Will hunting script is off the charts incredible like off the charts incredible and yeah so what you see in the film is great but the script is even more incredible find that to be a rewatchable movie as yeah, well absolutely. Good Will hunting. well i have one script on my desk here at the collider studios office if you want to call it a desk it gets taken over from time to time Aww, do you know what the script is I do know what the script is given to me by the man himself who wrote it Tommy Wiseau, the room. I have a, the room, autograph the room nice. script, and they don't get better than that, so I'm going to stay with that. We hope we helped you find more movie scripts online, and thank you guys for tuning in to Collider Movie Talk. You guys can catch us again 4 p.m. PST. I was told not to say standard time oh. anymore, because I, I just say PST. That's just what rattles off the tongue, but it's 4 p.m. in Los Angeles, so do the math wherever you live. If you live in St. Louis, which I hear is just a stone's throw away, <laughs> you guys can probably watch us around then, too, every month. Monday through Thursday. I want to thank Perry Nemiroff and the traveling inclined John Roca. He's up for action adventure. She's a horror film fan, and I just love you guys. Have a great day. We'll see you all tomorrow on Collider Movie Talk. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You want to watch more? Then click up here, or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.